Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by HipChat. Collaborate, save time, and be more productive with your teams. HipChat is IM, video chat, plus file code and screen sharing all in one place. Invite your team members and get a free 30-day trial of the full version of HipChat at hipchat.com slash C101. And by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Go to squarespace.com and enter the offer code C101 at checkout to get 10% off. Today on Coding 101, it's a wild card episode with Miriam Joie. Hello and welcome to Coding 101. It's Twit's Coding Show where we let you into the wonderful world of the Code Monkey and the Code Warrior. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the Digital Jesuit, and joining me today again is our super special guest co-host. We really got to come up with a better name than that, Mr. <laughs> Lou Maresca. Lou, thank you for coming back onto the show as our super special guest co-host. <laughs> Thanks, Pedro, for having me again. How have you been, sir? I'm doing well. Doing real well. I heard you're you're having a little cold from your trip. A, a little cold from my trip. I, this is what happens when you squeeze into an aluminum tube of disease uh, filled <laughs> with crying babies for five and a half hours of fun. And then also, I, I believe, uh, because of the weird weather we're having in California, the pollen count is through the roof, and it is knocking me on my butt. I don't know if you suffer from the same issues, but, uh, yeah, it, it kind of makes me want to stay indoors and, and just touch the computer because every time I go outside, it's like my head starts leaking. I know that feeling. Mildew and mold here in the in the Pacific Northwest. Well, we're not here to talk about mildew and mold. <laughs> Lou, we're here to talk about dogs and cats living together. The end of the world. That's right. The two titans of tech, Google and Microsoft, are, are working together? Yeah, this was an interesting story, I think, because Angular is a framework that uh, Google's kind of come up with a while back, and it's what they call an MVC framework. And if you, you remember, Padre, we talked about this a while ago. MVC framework is just the model view controller pattern where you're separating data from like when you get back from a service or from a database to the way the user actually sees it. And so that's what an MVC framework allows you to do. And that pattern makes your code easier to maintain. It makes it easier to test. And those are really both good characteristics to have in, in today's code. So that's really what Angular is. And so they, they basically tried to iterate on that framework um, and make it better. And, and the new version of it is built on top of Angular 2, they call it, is now built on top of something called ActScript. And ActScript was debuted back in, I think, October last year. Um, and it's also another superset uh, on top of JavaScript, very similar to drum roll, uh, very similar to the TypeScript that Microsoft developed. So we talked about that before, too. Uh, I, Lou, I got to ask this. It seems like this space gets more and more crowded every year. There's always an alternative to something to fix a particular bug or a particular feature that someone didn't like in another language. Why would I go with Angular or Angular 2? Why would, why, why would I look at this at all as the framework that I develop in? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question because they, a lot of times these companies, they think, well, we, you know, they do one, they build these things specifically for a particular need internally for the company. But for what Angular was built for was more to allow people to build better UI in, in the, the current web framework and make it easier to kind of maintain and test and also hook it up to, you know, some of the newer standards. So like, for instance, Angular, especially Angular 2 is made to kind of work on top of both the current JavaScript as well as the new ECMAS 6 script stuff, which we actually talked about previously in a previous episode. So these frameworks are supposed to make it easier for you. And also, the whole purpose of moving uh, to ActScript, and now the whole, we'll talk about in a second around the collaboration of potentially even moving to TypeScript, is what the code that's actually emitted from these, these frameworks is code that you can take 
and give it to somebody else and say, here's the JavaScript that this was, you know, that was emitted from or compiled out of this framework. And they can look at it and actually understand exactly what it says and maybe even improve on it. So it's, it's readable code and reusable code. And it makes it easier for people to, to, to actually share it. And so that's why these frameworks are so big nowadays. Now, when to choose one over the other, that's a really hard uh, question to ask. And in fact, it's actually a religious war nowadays <laughs> in, in web development. Well, let me, let me push you on that. When would you choose to use Angular over another framework? I, like, for example, I, I know I'm, I'm just throwing this at you. Whip this off, off the top of your head. Give me a project and then give me the potential frameworks and then tell me which one you would choose. <laughs> Sure. So like if you're like, for instance, if you're building an application that is very, very heavy on the UI and you don't necessarily need to do a lot of data binding, like for instance, maybe it's just a like a website or something for information like Wikipedia or something and there's no data entry or something like that. You really don't need these types of these frameworks because they, they are not really made for to be able to bind and do dependency injection, all special things on the server. So you could use something that's maybe more popular for you know, use user interface type development. There's a new framework by Facebook called React. It's basically UX related. It allows you to do really performant things in the UI. So it really depends, again, like you said, on, on the projects that you're doing. So if I'm just doing a very simple UI, but I need to be able to update data all the time on it, then React would be a good idea because that makes me, allows me to update things incrementally on the page and it's very performant. But if you're doing like a data entry type system, you know, even like a, a social network like Facebook or something, you might want something that allows you to, you know, bind to the way you're sending data back and forth to the server and make it easier to test. Wow. Okay. And th this is one of these areas where I, I know that the, the code warriors in our audience are going to love this. And they understand that, oh yeah, another framework, there's there's definitely a use case for it. There's going to be those times where this framework is going to make more sense when we want that MVC model. The the noobs in our, in our audience, all the code monkeys, all the people who are just getting learned up, this is going to be daunting because they're going to go, wait a minute, is is this a language I have to learn? Is this is this a new a thing that I need to add to my store of knowledge just as I'm starting to code? And that's not really the case, right, Lou? I mean, that, that's that's the idea behind right. the frameworks. These frameworks can take multiple languages and put them into a particular hierarchy. That's that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and that, you know, honestly, you just po pointed out like a very hard lesson that you'll actually learn when you start developing code is when you're using frameworks, they hide a lot of things, right? They try to do things for you, so they hide a lot of things, and then you they don't actually tell you how they're doing it, and then just emit things for you, and so it it creates a very complex scenario where people say, oh, it's going to be easy for me to as a beginner to write an app, but then when I actually write it, I don't actually ha know how it got written, right? So that's really the problem with some of these things. So if you're a, a beginner my recommendation is just to start with low level stuff like start working building your app with just straight javascript and using external services and databases and so on and trying to build your app that way and then you'll start to see the pains of doing that <laughs> and you'll get into trouble and then you'll say okay well what framework or other things can make my life easier and then that's really kind of the learning way of doing it. if you jump right into using these frameworks you'll never really understand what you're doing Right, and that's why we we're in the next module, we're actually going to start with Ruby, and then we're going to go to Rails. And the whole idea is start with something, and then you should figure out what it can and cannot do. And the things that it cannot do is when you start asking for a framework. And now, Lou, if people wanted to find out more about Angular, Angular 2, about this cooperation, are there any good resources for them? Is, is, there, is there a lot of, of momentum for this, this new framework? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the TypeScript team on Microsoft, they're basically working together with the Google Angular team um, to, to basically do better things in TypeScript so that Angular can be built on top of TypeScript instead of ActScript. And so you can go to MSDN or even some of the blogs, even by Microsoft or by the Google team, and there's a lot of information about how they're collaborating and they're making it easier for you to generate better code and all that type of thing. So you know, feel free to check those out and those links and those blogs. Fantastic. Now, folks, when we come back, we're going to be bringing in our special guest, Miss Miriam Joie. That's right. She's a code monkey. She's a code warrior. She's, uh, she's been on quite a few Twitch shows. I thought maybe you'd want to take advantage of her experience. But before we do that, let's take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101, and it's HipChat. Now, let me ask you a question. Quick question. Any of you who are in business or are participating in some sort of cooperative enterprise, how... Do you communicate? 
If you're like most, you probably use email, right? Voicemail, sure. Texting, IM, video chat, file sharing, all of those tools are available to you and they all work fantastically well. But the question is, are you using tools that are designed for your business? Because business communication is different. It's not just a simple matter of getting a message to someone or making sure someone else knows about an appointment. It's about putting business intelligence into the communication. And that's what HipChat does. Now, HipChat is IM. It's video chat. It's document sharing. It's screen sharing, system updates, and code sharing integrated into one simple platform. Email is too slow, meetings get sidetracked, and regular IM doesn't really work well for groups. HipChat keeps your team in sync, and it works from any device no matter where you are. And most importantly, it creates a memory, a history of your communications. Now, let me guess, when you want to communicate in a historical method, you probably use email and you, you use the, the attachments or you use a, a CC form and you get layers upon layers upon layers of email threads. Well, get rid of that. Simplify it. Make it easier to find the information that you're looking for with HipChat. Now, the best part, HipChat integrates with the top developers like GitHub, Jira, Zendesk, and more. Check out the 57 services that HipChat plays nice with, things that are going to make your life easier as a code monkey or a, a code warrior. HipChat brings your entire project and team communications together. It's easy to set up, it's fun to use, and it makes your team widely productive. We know that because we use HipChat here in the Twit Breakhouse. When we need to communicate and find out where an idea came from or when a, where a particularly important decision was made, we can go back through our HipChats and we can find out exactly where we came from. It's, it's powered, part of the business and the power of communications. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to get your team on the same page in seconds. There's a freemium version that you can use free forever, but for the next 30 days, you'll get the full version of HipChat, which includes the bonus features of video and screen sharing. You can try HipChat free, no credit card required. Just visit hipchat.com slash C101. That's hipchat.com slash C101. Sign up. Click on Start Chatting, then invite a few team members and try it free for 30 days. And for the first 100 signups, HipChat is going to extend that 30-day free offer to 90 days. That's three months of service. Remember, that's hipchat.com slash C101. HipChat, your team, your project, in sync, instantly. And we thank HipChat for their support of Coding 101. We welcome to the show a friend of the Twit TV network. I've had her on Padre's Corner, and I thought, well, she has to be on Coding 101. A longtime friend of the Twit Army, Miriam Jouar. Miriam, thank you very much for uh, talking to us today. Hey, Robert. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great. Uh, I've never been on C101, so uh, good to be able to talk about uh, my coding days, I guess. Uh, we've seen you all over the place. We've seen you on Twit. We've seen you, on, of course, on All About Android. We've seen you on Padres Corner and, of course, be, before you buy. So I, I had to have you back because even though you don't do it now, you were actually quite the prolific coder. Yes, yes. I, I, you know, I still dick around from time to time, obviously, but uh, no, no professional coding, at least recently. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about on Padres Corner when I had you on is that you were involved in a project that is near and dear to the hearts of gamers <laughs> everywhere, a beloved game yes. known as Homeworld. Now, I, I think this, this kind of harkens back to some of the material we talked about when I had uh, Steve Gibson on the show, where back in the day, and when I say <laughs> the day, I mean 10, 20 years ago, it's not really that much in the day, Coders had to be ingenious. You had to be very efficient. You had to be sneaky because you, you didn't have a whole lot of resources. Nowadays, you could just throw memory, CPU, and storage at the problem and, and basically get away with inefficient coding. But when you were creating the, if the original home world, you had to make next generation graphics with last generation hardware. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, sure. So uh, just a bit of background. So, um, you know, I went to school uh, studying electrical engineering and applied mathematics and uh, primarily because I was tinkering with electronics and computers early on in the 70s. And I thought hardware was something I really wanted to get under my belt. And but I quickly realized software was going to be it. So I went into, uh, you know, I, I didn't formally learn any software. Back when I did software, you kind of had to if you want to do something interesting, you have to do grad studies, right? You couldn't 
Like if you just took computer science, you're going to end up writing crappy code in COBOL for a bank somewhere, right? In the 90s, early, late 80s, early 90s. So I decided, no, I want to do some cool stuff. So I'm going to do uh, hardware and then I'll, the software will kind of come with it. And quickly, I became a software engineer on the side. And I did some medical research work, um, uh, medical imaging and audiology. So I have a lot of background in signal processing and, 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 and you know, basically extracting signal from data. Um, and so somewhere along the way, I moved to Vancouver, Canada, uh, and I was very active on a lot of um, uh, sound like audio boards, like people doing uh, bootleg recordings and stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with, there's a whole universe of people <laughs> yes. out there who, who do bootleg recordings. And back then we just had uh, small uh, digital audio tape recorders and mini disc recorders. There was no way to quickly take, pull out your phone, plug a good set of microphones and record, right? So um, through that community, I, I they found out that I, I knew a lot about signal processing and some guys were leaving EAA to start their own company, Relic Entertainment, to make this crazy game Homeworld. And, you know, at the time it was like, I was like, when I basically got hired, I was employee number nine at, at Relic Entertainment, something like that. And I spent two years uh, well, three almost from like late 96 to, to uh, 99 when it was launched, making this game. I'm pointing on my screen here because you're, you're showing it. Um, and Homeworld was, you know, my first foray into video games. It was the beginning of a career that ended up spanning 15 years. And, and I worked uh, for a whole bunch of companies like uh, LucasArts, Sony Computer Entertainment, uh, I worked for THQ, uh, you know, basically a whole bunch of big studios doing all kinds of stuff. I worked for Shaba Games here in San Francisco on some extreme sports games that were a lot of fun. I eventually moved away from PCs into consoles. Uh, a place, I was kind of always at the leading edge of doing the consoles. So I did launch titles for PlayStation 2 for original Xbox and GameCube, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, you know, PS3 and, and beyond. Um, but Homeworld has always been dear to my heart because it's really the most fun I ever had coding. Because um, once I got into consoles, we kind of had to use a lot of the tools that were provided by, you know, Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, and and stick with that. And it was a little more restrictive in what you could do. My area of expertise in video games was sound coding, so writing audio engines for games. And on the PC, you had a little bit more freedom. Homeworld, uh, back to your question, Homeworld, the challenge was uh, we had this epic storyline with uh, fantastic graphics, the first th real-time strategy game with full 3D rendered universe where you could put the camera and everything anywhere you wanted. So it introduced the third dimension to uh, RTSs. Until then, it was all isometric for you. You really didn't have the concept of placing yourself anywhere you wanted. So we needed, in addition to an awesome renderer and great graphics, we needed a way to do the audio justice as well. And because it was a great storyline to be told in a single player, um, we had a ton of content to put on disc. And as you have to remember back in, in the late 90s, when you wanted to ship a CD for a game, first of all, it ran on DOS. And uh, if you're lucky, it ran on Windows. And then you had to ship it um, so that it would fit into six, 650 megs. 650 megs was what you could get, the space you could get pressing a CD. Like you could certainly burn a CD with more than 650 megs, but to actually reliably print a CD at the factory, it needed to be 650. So my challenge, my job was to kind of find a way to put about five hours of audio. If you add all the, the, the voice chatter from the radio transmissions and Homeworld, the music, the sound effects, everything that's audio in Homeworld, uh, and you put it on one, and you put it all together, it's about five hours of audio. And I had to find a way to squeeze that into the CD alongside the textures and the game and the executable and the installer and all the other stuff that comes in, the, the, the level editor and all that stuff. And, um, it was challenging. You know, back then there was MP3, there was a bunch of codecs that were lossy that would allow us to do this. But the decoding time, the amount of CPU required to decode that audio, especially if you played multiple streams, was like just not p possible. Uh, you could try to use accelerated audio like uh, a direct sound and there were a bunch of other uh, uh, standards out there like A3D. 
um, because nobody had gelled yet on a hardware acceleration for PCs at the time. Uh, but the problem with using those is that you kind of box yourself in. It was very much like consoles. You, you were very limited in what you could do. So I said to the team, look, I think I can create an, uh, an audio engine that's a software renderer, basically, that doesn't require any accelerated audio hardware. You can treat your sound card like a digital to analog converter, a stereo um, DAC. And my sound engine will do all the mixing and all the decoding of uh, all, all the compressed audio in real time and all the filtering in real time. And it will scale up depending on how good your processor is. Um, so the minimum requirements we set out were a Pentium 2 MMX, sorry, ten, Pentium MMX 200 megahertz. So wrap your head around that for a second. The average microcontroller today that's ARM-based in, in a wearable like this Withings that I demoed on Before You Buy is more powerful today than that Pentium I was having to use. And I was allowed 10% of that CPU budget. And so I created the sound engine that would allow to mix a minimum of uh, 16 channels um, at 22 kilohertz uh, sample rate. Uh, in real time and output them in stereo. And that was on a Pentium 200 MMX. I used some of the MMX extensions for that uh, if they were available, but not too much trickery, just really efficient coding, very, very compact footprint. But here's the cool part. All the audio was encoded 44.1. And so if you have a faster CPU, the audio engine would scale up to 44.1. And the more CPU uh, horsepower you gave it, so if you ran it on like a Pentium 3 uh, uh, later on, a few years later, it would take up more of that bandwidth. The, C the, the audio engine would always use 10%. Uh, you could manually in the setting change that if you wanted to, but it would decode up to 44.1 and it would do it up to, you know, as many voices as as the CPU could handle, really, basically. I think I, I capped it to like something like 64 voices because beyond that, it starts becoming very brouhaha-ish. Um, uh, let, let, let me ask you about that for a second. Uh, you know, that's that idea of working in such a limited amount of resources. That we, we've got one person in the chat room, Zendrum, who's already saying, oh, that looks horrible. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You put yourself back 20 years <laughs> and, and remember what we had to work with back then. And as you were saying, we were working with the Pentium MMX. The MMX, the, the, uh, the multimedia instruction set, did make things faster, but you didn't know, especially if you're working on the PC side. This is what makes it different from the console side. And I think this taps into you saying it was so exciting to program for PCs. You had to design for the worst possible computer that they'd be playing in but let it expand up yep. to the best possible computer that they could be playing in. What what are the decisions that have to be made to make that happen? Yeah, and so I was touching on that. You know, we kind of had a minimum, we, we set a minimum bar for what the hardware would be and we coded everything so it would work on that. And then it would beautify as you, you added horsepower, right? Um, uh, in terms of uh, graphics hardware, we supported three stand, OpenGA, the 3D, uh, APIs for uh, the Voodoo cards back then, uh, and then the the um, uh, the Direct so uh, Direct 3D uh, sorry Direct yeah all of the DirectX stuff, uh, and then OpenGL. I said there's three of them, uh, the, but there's a little hidden gem in in the original Homeworld. So if you get the original CD, it's actually if you can see it, it's on my shelf right uh, behind me. Let's see, uh, right about there <laughs> is on my shelf. You can see the box for Homeworld. So the, and that box is a CD. It doesn't look like that, by the way. But um, in that, on that CD, you have a software renderer as well. So the software renderer was genius because it scales. You can go up to 4K. It gives you the maximum performance, the maximum textures, all the lighting. So on a modern machine, if you find a virtual, if you run a virtual DOS box, you can run the original Homeworld that's sitting on my shelf back there at some resolutions that, and, and performance that we never tested it for. But it scales. And, and my audio renderer scales as well. So that's kind of what we did. Um, of course, the textures are very compressed and limited, right? So you can only get so much in terms of quality. One of the nice things about the remaster is that, you know, they were able to re reduce a, a lot of the code for Homewall was made open source at somewhere along the way. And so they're able to take a lot of the assets and redo them and improve them. Uh, and, and that way, you know, it's it's been modernized. But I think there's there's a certain charm to the original if you if you pull it out and play it, uh, Let me, especially actually, on modern I, hardware. I have a question about that because both Brian and I have spent a lot of time over the last 
month or so playing the remastered version of Homeward. Brian, how much? How many hours do you think you've put into that game so far? <coughs> the the one that Steam says. I yes. Put into, or, or, I kind of leave my game on to collect all the resources sometimes, so it's not that accurate. <laughs> but I'm gonna say 60, 60 ish hours. <laughs> it's it's been a lot of hours. I'm probably I'm probably halfway to him. But uh, you know, yeah. yeah here here's the remastered version. So of course, the the graphics look incredible. They've they've bumped everything up. But Miriam. How many of the old assets did they did they use here? I mean, how much how much of the structure did they pull over to the remaster, or is the remastered truly just a, a brand new set of code? I honestly don't know. You know, I'm not familiar with the development process and the team here. It looks to me like they would have had to redo a lot of stuff. Um, they, they probably hired a bunch of artists to redo the textures. There's no way I could see them uh, reusing what was there. Um, it's the same with the audio. They probably had access to the original waveforms, uh, and they were able to re to redo it. And I bet you they use zero of my code in here. There's no need. I mean, nowadays you can mix, you know, MP3 compressed audio in real time without any L effects, or probably hundreds of voices with a one percent CPU, right? So um, it's it's a different world. But but of course you can also see the improvements in lighting. Um, right. But, but I that's think the engine. That They're just using a much stronger engine. Exactly. It's really what it is. If you look at it, I mean, I think looking at the original today still blows my mind how good. And if you listen to it with headphones, I virtualize the audio in 3D. So you actually, when you're looking at a spaceship and it's it's in front of you like this, and you get the exhaust like in your face, it sounds really different than if you move the camera and put the exhaust right. uh, facing away from you. Like I did all that filtering in real time and it's outputting in stereo and I did phase shifting so that if you have a surround sound decoder with ProLogic, you need ProLogic or ProLogic 2 because it needs to take a two, two channel audio source and turn it into 5.1 surround. Uh, if you have one of those ProLogic receivers, most I think most of them have a mode for that, uh, you'll actually get stuff coming out from your rear speakers. Right. So, you know, I, I, I thought it, we didn't get the Dolby logo because we couldn't get the uh, the official stamp of approval from Dolby. By the way, Dolby is a company I ended up working for later on, doing some really crazy voiceover IP, uh, real-time 3D uh, rendering for for, uh, for mobile devices. Uh, great, great company to work for. So, you know, Homeworld and Relic really opened a whole bunch of doors for my career as a software engineer and really let me be creative. They basically trusted my judgment on how to implement this crazy technology because what they were doing themselves was reinventing the whole thing. They reinvented the storyline, the storytelling, the RTS strategy, like the, the, the actual gameplay with the fully floating 3D. They, they reinvented how to render video, um, you know, graphics and how to create a 3D rendering engine. And so for the audio, they said, she's crazy enough, we're gonna hire her and she's gonna make this work. And I did, and it, it was startup, you know, it was a lot of blood, sweat and tears. I, I did like 60 to 80 hour weeks for, for years. In fact, you know, we thought we were gonna ship this thing in 98 and then it kept slipping because Sierra Online, our publisher was in the process of getting acquired by the French company. I can't remember what they're called now. Vivendi, and um, it was just, you know, they kept pushing back the deadline. So we kept, we were in final mode for like a year and working these crazy hours and having no life, but it was, it was so much fun. We so Part of the reason Homeworld is so good, I think, is because we were able to keep iterating on a game we thought was final for a year. <laughs> so we kept polishing the game design. I kept polishing the audio render. Like I kept trying to get make my codec even better every time. But whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute. You're saying that it got better because you had time to reiterate, but the most famous example of just code bloat in the world, Duke Nukem Forever, they had that same opportunity. They kept reiterating, reiterating, reinventing the code, and it made that horrible. So it's it's not necessarily time, team, right? right? Yeah, Dif different team. Different team. We, we were very selective about what we did. Towards the end, I wasn't even working on audio anymore. I did the entire installer. So if you run the original PC game, when you see the installer run, which I can't remember what uh, off-the-shelf installing system we used, but I wrote all the scripts for it and made sure that everything worked. I also did the copy protection for that CD, by the way. is There's, there's a big gaping hole hole if you want to copy this because you know i don't believe in copy protection so they gave me the copy protection to do and i made it basically good enough 
so that the average casual person wouldn't be able to break it. But if you just know how to use a hex editor, trust me, you can get around the copy protection <laughs> without changing the binary. Let me, let me so, ask you about that because I remember from back in the day when a game would be newly released and probably the same week of the release, there was an incredibly detailed way to break the copy protection. And it always felt to me that it had to be someone from the dev team. There was someone on the dev course. team who was like, I, yeah, I put this in here. You have to understand, our, <laughs> our, it was a contract we had with our publisher that we had to have copy protection. We all were rolling our eyes. And, and one day we're all sitting around and they point at me and they're like, you're it, you did the file streamer. <laughs> it's the file thing. You f you'd get us some copy protection on that CD. And I'm like, oh, do I really have to? So I did it and it, you know, it's good enough. It passes the, the minimum requirements that they set out. Uh, at the publisher, but trust me, it's really it was really easy right. to crack. Um, uh, let, let, then, let, let, know, me bring my, let me bring my co-host in here because he, he can bring us uh, an interesting angle on this because he, he is a current programmer. Uh, he doesn't program games, but he does program a lot of software that the people use on a daily basis. Lou, uh, let me ask you, uh, first of all, that idea of being able to scale your code up. Uh, I mean, take, take Homeworld, something that a project that started almost 20 years ago got better was a phenomenal success at release and then was remastered more than a decade later. Is What would you do, what would Microsoft do with a, a typical code project that might span decades? Uh, do you look at scalability at the very beginning or is that just something that gets tacked on at the end? So if you're talking about some of the original code, like for instance, maybe even some of the Office products, they didn't necessarily believe that it was gonna be used uh, by you know, million, billion people, right? So I think it might have not been designed for scale, but most products today, nowadays, they're built for for the need for scale. So mm -hmm. scale out and scale up is really the, the basic property that most so software has to build on today. So like client install applications, eh, maybe not so much, but anything that has to do with web, anything that has to do with services, anything that has to do with even really light clients or thin clients on your app on your machine those are all built to be able to scale out and scale up so if you're not designing for that then you're making a mistake <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're here with uh, miriam joie the uh, one of the programmers for homeworld if you've ever played the game then uh, then you you have admiration for her work if you haven't played the game you can download the the remastered version from steam and uh, see part of the universe that she created now we're going to get right back to her but first Let's go ahead and, and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of Coding 101. Now, l let me ask you something. Do you have a presence on the web? Of course you do, right? I mean, even if it's something like Twitter or Facebook, you, you've got some way to tell people where you are. They can locate you on their mobile devices, on their laptop, on their desktop. But do you really have a presence? I mean, do you have a place that spells out who you are and what you work on to show off your, your videos, your photos, your portfolio, your work, your ministry, whatever it may be? Chances are, if, if you are like millions and millions of people around this country, you, you don't, which is why you need Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to get yourself up on the web in prime real estate so that people can find you and find out what you've been doing. Now, with Squarespace, it's easy for you to create a professional website, a blog, or an online store. It features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. I've been using Squarespace for the last few years because I have a lot of organizations that I support that are less than techie. They have content. They have things that they want to get out to the world, but they don't have a programmer. They don't have a database guy. They don't have a server guy. They don't have the time and they don't have the resources to go out and buy a, a web host and uh, and get their domain from another provider and then, and then maybe worry about what they're going to use in the back end. So I always push them to Squarespace. It's a one-stop shop to get a beautiful, beautiful presence on the internet. Now, it's simple, it's powerful, it's beautiful. Making changes is clearer and simpler than ever because with Squarespace 7, they now give you a preview window. So you can see in real time what your changes are doing to the real live look of your page. That's incredibly important so that you don't have to go back and forth between code window and preview window. It also starts at just $8 a month. And they take care of the hosting so that you don't have to. Plus, you get a free domain name if you buy Squarespace for a year. All Squarespace websites are responsive and they scale to look great on any device. Now, for those people who are big do-it-yourselfers, I know that this is a hassle. There are plugins that kind of work if you're using WordPress or Drupal, but there's nothing that says noob 
like having a site that looks great on a laptop or a desktop but doesn't render properly on a phone or a tablet. That's right. You, you want the, the one-stop package, the, the all-in-one so that you will look great no matter what your, your user is watching your content in. Now, e-commerce is available with, uh, with every package. Every website comes with a free online store. And with cover pages, you can set up a beautiful one-page online presence in minutes, including your branding. It's perfect for creating quick landing pages for your brand, your personal identity, or to promote a new product. So here's what we would like you to do. We want you to get started with Squarespace. Start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code C101 to get 10% off your first purchase and to throw some love to Coding 101. We thank Squarespace for their support of Coding 101. Squarespace, build it beautiful. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Coding 101. Miriam, let's get back to you. So, Homeworld, of course, this, this was something that is it's big in your life. It's, it's, uh, it's something that you will always remember, and it's something that you can point back to and say, I, I did that, I did that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you've, you kind of left the world of coding. Uh, can you tell me why? Yeah, so, you know, one of my passions was to create these audio engines and, and really develop them into things that would be used by multiple games. You know, this uh, my engine was used by Cataclysm, which is a Homeworld variation. Uh, and although I didn't write the code for Homeworld 2, some of it ended up in there. Uh, also did all the tools, so all the packaging tool to package the assets into something that would end up on the CD were in by me. But, uh, the, you know, the thing is consoles seemed to be more of a challenge to me eventually, especially once consoles started using and supporting waveform audio properly. Um, and that really started with the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. So I, I, I jumped into consoles and did a whole bunch of ch challenging work there. Uh, again, most of my work was creating audio engines that would be used by the game the programmers uh, without having them worry about the hardware specifics. So I would create a basically a set of APIs in-house that the studio would use to uh, play audio and, hand, and manage audio in any game that was done by the entire uh, studio, uh, s you know, such that they didn't have to worry about the specific of how audio is played on a PlayStation versus a GameCube versus an Xbox. And so uh, think of it, if it is a virtual a virtualization layer, uh, API layer, that the game developers could just call directly and they would know it would just work and behave the same on all platforms. And it's same with the uh, content providers. So the, uh, the audio, the mixers, uh, the sound designers, those guys would use my tools to package the audio for each platform and they never had to worry about, you know, the specifics of what codec to use and what's, you know, how does this uh, work best on this platform. And so that's what a lot of what I did. But eventually, you know, uh, there were some commercial um, sound engines that off the shelf that became available out there. And they started getting used by console developers and by game developers. The kind of like central tech aspect of big studios, even at EA, started to fade away. And so I'm not at the core a really a gamer. I love games. I find them tech Technically challenging as a developer, that was was fun about it for me was the challenge technically, but it wasn't about the game so much. Uh, so, you know, I found that I the challenges were starting to erode, and I didn't really have there wasn't really enough room for really for me to be creative with, with the technology anymore, and it was starting to become a chore a bit. Uh, so I try to recycle myself into doing more. You know, after ten years or so, you know, doing a lot of mentorship and teaching people my tricks and, and what I learned. And so I, I started doing developer support, developer evangelism. That's how I ended up at Sony Computer Entertainment. I basically was the person for a few years there at Sony that if you went to a developer conference about the PlayStation Portable, a PSP, uh, PS2, PS3. Uh, and the eventually towards the end, the PS Vita, you, and, and there was an audio track at the PlayStation conference, a developer track. I was the one on stage doing the talk, right? Um, I would be the person that I would get a call at 3 a.m. from my boss that would say, Miriam, pack your bags. You have a flight at 5 a.m. You're, uh, we're, you know, dropping you by parachute at Rockstar uh, Games um, or whatever. Uh, in whatever city in the U.S., so that you can fix this bug for this uh, this major game like you know uh, Rock Band or whatever that's going live and needs to be gold tomorrow. So f find the problem, fix it. Um, this is what I ended up kind of doing towards the end of my career. And honestly, I thought I was going to continue. Um, 
I was actually thinking of starting my own company around making mobile games. I felt that mobile was the next frontier, that a lot of the challenges we had seen in PCs and consoles now apply to making games on iPhone and Android. And so if I hadn't become a tech journalist professionally, I think I would have ended up starting a company with some friends making some really cool technology-driven mobile games um, and potentially non-games like apps. Uh, and, and that never happened because, you know, I started blogging in 2006 or so uh, uh, for my own fun. And, you know, my, my own blog took off like crazy. And eventually I got hired by Engadget. And I was faced with a choice. Do I change my career and leave coding behind, become a professional blogger, a professional tech journalist or tech reporter? Or do I, um, you know, continue to keep that as a hobby and, and be a game developer? And I just felt like it, it was a great opportunity to to do some to try something else I, I thought i tried for a few months and then you know here i am uh five years later or whatever still working as a professional um uh a tech reporter however you know my my title down here is cheats a little bit but i um i do more, more than that now i do a lot of consulting you know most i make most of my money actually advising startups on how to launch and how to do uh, their their media campaigns and how to do their product strategy so yeah, that makes me a tech pundit. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> uh, but but you know that's that's what I do now. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know I'm kind of in between gigs in terms of full time employment. But I do a lot of consulting, which is great. Uh, and, and it's opened a lot of doors to me. You know, I think the the biggest thing is contrary to a lot of tech journalists, I know the tech. Like I understand. When I see an app, I can visualize in the back of my head what the software architecture for that app is. When I see a piece of hardware that launches on Kickstarter, like the original Pebble, I kind of know what's inside. Like I understand what a microcontroller is. I know how, you know, I know how an OS runs. All this stuff really helps me when I write a story about technology because I actually get a lot of the challenges around power management, efficiency, you know, thermal efficiency, and all these things that are really critical to mobile technology today. You know, it's, it's funny because I'm getting flashbacks to the uh, session we did with Steve Gibson, and one of his sticking points was he wanted people to get more interested in the foundational technology. And the idea was, you may not be a programmer, but you should know how programming works. You may not be an EE major, but you should understand how electronics, how the IC works. And you need to move from just being able to know how to use a tool to knowing how the tool actually works. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. That's one of the unique pieces that you bring to tech journalism, which is you're not just talking about a press release, you're talking about the tech. And you know how they probably put it together, and you know how they probably programmed it, and you know how they probably should market it. Uh, that, that's an amazing, amazing combination. Uh, I, 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 I got to ask this. I'm going to throw a little bit of uh, fire here uh, for our own little <laughs> flame war. Because you've, you've broached on a very sensitive topic for both gamers and programmers alike, and that is this world of the PC versus the console. I, I have spoken <laughs> with people who love working with console development because they know exactly what kind of hardware you're, they're developing for. And they know what the parameters are, they know how many resources they're going to have, and they'll squeeze as much performance out of that console as possible. But it sounds to me as if you're saying that when consoles started to take over the gaming world, it made it less interesting of a challenge for you as a programmer. I don't think. Um, I don't think it's a wow, nice Brian. Uh, I don't think that's uh, really what I'm getting to. What I'm getting to is that the 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 big money game industry, like the big studios that I was working for, have no interest in creativity on, on the technical mm, level okay. anymore. Yeah. They are just using engines off the shelf that they've used for years. They changed their assets. You know, last year was Madden 2014. This year is Madden 2015. <laughs> we tweak a few things. We add, you know, we add what we need to do. But there's no, I don't feel like there's a creative outlet in console and mainstream PC gaming anymore. Okay. Very rarely do I see a game where I go, wow, this was cool. Bioshock was one of them. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and to me... On a, on a developer side, I don't see too much progress there either. I think the cool stuff is really happening on mobile right now. And uh, I'm in, 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 and back to what you were saying about, you know, understanding the guts of stuff. To me, I find that like when I talk to web developers and, and you know, mo kind of younger developers that have come to age as developers in the, in the last five to 10 years, it's amazing to me how little they know and understand about the hardware. And, and to me, that's why I love the uh, you know, Raspberry Pi and Arduino, because it brings us back to kind of like this 
this really important symbiosis between hardware and software. I truly believe that if you want to be a good software engineer, you have to understand hardware. Even if your work involves, you know, writing database, uh, you know, Node.js stuff uh, that's virtualized on a, some server out there running some kind of, you know, virtual machine of Windows on top of a Linux. It doesn't matter to me. All of that I get. I understand how it works. But I think if you don't, if you never coded down at the register level and actually seeing those LEDs turn on and off when you flip the bits <laughs> in software right in front of you, then you haven't actually coded because that's really what it's about. It's, you know, software is this malleable world that lets you change your environment around you through hardware. And to me, that's what makes it fun. That's why I say if you're out there and you're like an, a, a, a super guru at, at, you know, Ruby on Rails, just and that's all you know and that's all you breathe and you're really good at it please do me a favor buy yourself an arduino connect some stuff to it and flip some bits and then come back and talk to me because then you'll really have experience what it is like to code and that's you know i'm old school a lot of people disagree with that but i i really believe that's something that we all need to have as much as we all need to understand that sometimes you want to prototype an app and not worry about memory management and you don't care because your 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 machine in all practical for all practical purposes with its eight gig or sixteen gigs of RAM has unlimited memory, right? It doesn't matter, um, and that's great. It's nice to be able to iterate really quickly and prototype stuff without having to worry about the constraints of the hardware. But I think that it's more fun when you start creating your and like build a box for yourself and try to stick to that box. Like just be bound by the parameters and try to do the best you can in these within this box, right? To me, I think it makes us more creative and push the envelope better. And then the skills you learn from that apply to the bigger problems that are much more complicated and are not nearly quite as tightly bound. And that's, that's how I see it. Words of wisdom. Thank you, Miriam, very much for being here on Coding 101. It's, it's always great to talk to you, no matter what show you might be on. Uh, you're just, you're, you're surprising. You're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, you're fantastic with product reviews, and uh, I'm, I'm just very happy to be able to work with you. Miriam Joar, could you please tell the Coding 101 audience where they can find you online? Sure thing. So the best way to probably find me is to follow me on Twitter at Tankerl. It's like Tankerl, the comic book character, without the vowels. Uh, my blog is at Tankerl.com. You'll find uh, um, you'll find a bunch of YouTube videos of reviews and whatever I find that's interesting. Thing. I make, generally make a YouTube video and a blog post. So you'll find my YouTube channel from there, which is something you probably should subscribe to. Uh, and then, you know, you'll find me on Twit on various shows. As, as uh, Father said, you'll find me on, uh, you know, BYB, on, sometimes on uh, All About Android. Uh, you'll find me on, while well, I was on Padre's Corner, I'm on Twit. Uh, I'm here on C101. So, you know, a bunch of different shows. Uh, I also do a my own podcast, which is on my YouTube channel. It's about once a month. And then I do guest appearances on all kinds of other podcasts. Uh, you know, The Virgin Gadget, all about Android. Sorry, I mean, Android Central. Uh, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Just use a totally guest type things. Uh, I also write. Uh, you'll find my writing on ReadWrite. You'll find my writing on Mobile Geeks and on uh, Android Central, iMore, Windows Central, although I haven't written there much recently, but I did a lot of work for them at CES. So, you know, I do freelance work. You'll find me around out there. Uh, yeah, add me to your social networks and all that good stuff. Always a pleasure. We'll see you next time, uh, no matter what show it may be. I know you have a hard out, so we'll bid you farewell. Miriam Joar, yes. we salute you, our code warrior. Thanks so much, Robert. Thanks, everybody. I got to sign out. I got another meeting. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Now, uh, also, we, of course, need to thank our super special guest co-host. He's, he's stuck around with us forever. Lou Maresca, come back in here. Where'd you go? Let's see if Brian... There, there, tch, there you are. There you are. Uh, I, I know we, we had you kind of silent there for a bit because, uh, you know, I had a fantastic conversation with Miriam. But, but sir, it is always a pleasure to have you. Uh, it, it makes the show better. I think you bring a wealth of knowledge and being... Of, of the three of us that were on the show today, the only active coder who does this for a living. Could you please tell the audience where they can find you? Because I know you've got a presence that's growing online and uh, we want people to jump on. 
Absolutely. Well, coding is like riding a, riding a bike, so you always can get get back on. Uh, but uh, you can definitely find me. Follow me on Twitter at at Lou M M L O U M M, and of course, find me active also in the Google Plus uh, community over in the Coding One and One community. So check that out as well. And uh, you'll be able to find him very soon. I'm not exactly sure when, but very soon he will become one of our regular reviewers on Before You Buy. So yeah, you're going to get a helping heaping dose of the Lou M.M. Lou Maresca, thank you very much for being our super special guest co-host. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, don't forget, folks, that uh, we do this show live. That's right. Every Monday at 2.30 Pacific time, you can find us at live.twit.tv. If you join us live, you can be part of the pre-show and the post-show and see all the bloopers that get cut out of the final. And uh, as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. You guys would live in a little box right down there, right below my cameras, where I can find out what you're saying during the show. So if you have a question, if you have something you want to ask one of our guests, or when we're doing a coding module, if you're getting completely lost, you can always tell us to slow down. It's, it's a great way to participate in the experiment that is Twit TV. Also, don't forget that we've got a show page. Just go to twit.tv slash code or coding 101. It all goes to the same place. You'll have all of our episodes. If you want to download a particular module, like, for example, if you want to download our four-part Arduino, our introduction with Smitty, where he shows you how to make an Arduino clock, you can do that. If you want to see our notes so that you can get the actual code that we use in the modules, you can do that. Or if you just want to find out more about the guests that we have during our non-programming sessions of Coding 101, you can do that. Again, we do this because we want you to be as informed as possible. That's what Coding 101 is all about, to whet your appetite for the code. Uh, also, I want to thank everyone here in the, uh, the Twit Brickhouse who makes this show possible. Of course, to Leo and to Lisa for letting us do Coding 101. To uh, my super producer and TD, Mr. Brian Burnett, uh, Cranky Hippo. Uh, Cranky Hippo, where can they find you on the Twit TV network? On Twit.tv, you can find me uh, doing Know How with you on Thursdays. We have a lot of fun and uh, we've been having a little bit of a crossover with coding, doing that Arduino project. So, uh, Definitely check that out if you haven't already. And to keep it quick, follow me at Twitter at Cranky underscore Hippo. That's right. Oh, and, and one last bit. Mm -hmm. If you want to see more about Mir Miriam Jawar, she was actually on Padre's Corner. We had a longer interview, episode 22 of Padre's Corner. She is a fascinating person. You, really, you're going to watch it. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballister. This has been Coding 101. End of line. Go play Homeworld. Go play Homeworld.